I was facing a serious time in jail. And I had a lot of friends that were doing life sentences, and I knew that that could likely be my future. If I didn't make a change very quickly, I knew that my time was coming. Ryan Blair. Ryan Blair. Ryan Blair. Ryan Blair. 29-year-old multimillionaire Ryan Blair. Gang member to millionaire. Mr. Ryan Blair, number one New York Times bestselling author, serial entrepreneur, went on to do over $2 billion in sales, incredibly successful person, and a real visionary. What's between most people and their calling? That's the the holy grail of entrepreneurship. When you have a calling, you're not working. When you have a calling, you're inspired. When you have a calling, you wake up in gratitude. A calling is the most coveted place that we can be. And AI is gonna take the careers away. It's not gonna take the callings away. The way you get to a calling is through a series of alterations. You have to alter. The internet proliferates with these, you know, rags to riches, hero's journey stories, right? I'm I'm jazz musician turned successful entrepreneur. Your gang member turns near billion dollar company founder. So uh, that's that's quite the arc. Seems like maybe where we ought to start. Sure. Do you mind uh, filling in those details for us? Yeah, I don't mind. You know, I've... I've done a lot of interviews on the subject, so I always like to try to give new information or share something new or, you know, some new perspective. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier with the hero's journey, there is this archetype to success and all of us embody very similar stages in our, our, our journey. Although I started as a gang member and you started as a jazz musician, we end up wind up, we end up winding up acquiring some new information to share with the world. So what I'd love to share with the world about, you know, what it was like being in a gang, it was the highest risk, you know, living and lifestyle that you could possibly have. You know, a gang is a group of entrepreneurs that are organized in an illegal structure and we're seeking to make money and seeking to profit. And, you know, there's a hierarchy and there's a structure. And I found my way into that, not by choice. I was forced into it. And as a result of that, I, I you know, was involved in a gang at an early age and then went on to become a leader within it and then ended up exiting it after a mentor started investing in me and then decided that I'd start being a legal entrepreneur as opposed to an illegal entrepreneur. Okay, so I am, and, and, and everybody obviously listening to some degree knows my work. I mean, this is this is like my passion, right? Is that your your past, you know, it's, it's cliche to say your past doesn't define you, but I think that's oversimplifying life because the reality is your past holds all the possible seeds of your future. And I think for people to look to to develop that ability to look at their life and see based on what's behind them a different set of possibilities for what could be in front of them. I mean man, if I if I could say what am I trying to do in 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 one simple statement with this whole unlock your potential movement and book and podcast and even entre my my education platform, that's it, man. It's like well, I don't believe that somebody need some secret skill or some secret cheat code to create this amazing future for themselves. They might, they might end up acquiring those as tools, but the seeds are already there. So, so let's, I mean, you seem like potentially a pretty massive case study in what I'm saying here, right? Yeah. So, so how does a gang member, like talk me through the transformation, right? Of a gang member, first of all, having the, the balls to, I mean, there's so many questions, right? How did you have the balls to leave? When you say somebody invested in you, what did that really mean? How did you get that first clarity of vision that that you know felt real enough to take that first step in what could have been real danger? Like fill in all those questions of how the transformation was set up and how it occurred, if you would. Well, you know, I I was facing a serious time in jail, mm. and I had a lot of friends that were doing life sentences, and I knew that that could likely be my future. And if I didn't make a change very quickly, I knew that, you know, my time was coming. The type of crimes that I was involved in and the friends around me that were being, you know, sent away for the rest of their lives uh, was, was signs that I need to make a change. Otherwise, I'd have to fully commit to becoming a professional criminal and living a life as a professional criminal in jail or outside of jail. But I knew I had one or two choices. And the reason why I came to that conclusion was, you know, I was raised by my grandmother to be very spiritual. 
And so I knew that the, what I was doing was going to basically send me to hell if I kept on this path. That's mm-hmm. the way I framed it as a young child. You know, I hadn't murdered anyone, but I knew people who did. And, you know, I was around, you know, people that had murdered people. Mm. Um, and so I knew that I was going to wind up having that fate if I didn't make a change quickly. And so I, I made the change and it was a very difficult change to make. I had to, you know, completely abandon all my old friends, completely abandon my environment. I had people turn against me. People know that war friends and allies now were hunting me, looking to basically kill me or hurt me. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, was a bold move by all means, but I, I felt like I either was going to have to murder someone, I was either going to get murdered, or I had to leave. Yeah. So, I mean, I assume that the, the realization or the reality that you're describing, I mean, that's not unique to you. That's pretty consistent for all gang members, right? Either if you're not a murderer yet, you're probably on the way to becoming one. And if you don't, if you don't get killed first, and I mean, it's like everything you describe. I mean, it sounds like I'm, I'm watching The Wire or something, right? And so <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's not as quite as dramatic and, and exciting as all that, but but also probably not that unlike that either. It's it's probably more true to to the artistic rendering than most professions anyway would be. Um, but anyway, why why you why what what made you different? You said you were raised spiritually, but look, I mean that's a that's a trope, right? Like, oh yeah, I was I was raised you know by my grandma who always dragged me to church. You're not the only one. What made you different that you had this call, this calling? Yeah, the. You know, I just knew inside that there was, you know, that I, like I had a, a, a soul connection at a young age and I recognize that now. I didn't understand that, but there were, there were times where a little voice would speak to me and say, don't go in that car. And that car would wind up doing a drive-by shooting and everyone in it would go to jail for the rest of their lives. So there, I always felt there was a guiding force in my life. And when I look back at it now, I could see it clearly. Um, some call it a guardian angel, some call it intuition, whatever it is that you want to call it. There was something there protecting me all along. And I had free will, of course, and I often made the wrong choice. But when, you know, the stakes were very high, I made, you know, some of the right choices. And, you know, so I, I have to give credit to my spirituality, to my higher power, to, you know, have it, it, to the guidance that I had intuitively to not go down the path that you know, I was, I was heading on. Were you a good gang member? Like, were you good at being a gang member? Yeah, I was, I was what's called an enforcer. So I enforced the rules of the gang. And that, that meant I was one of the most violent of the group. And I was good at my job. You know, I made sure people uh, were in line. And I also organized a lot of people. So I was always a leader. And I had under my leadership, something like a hundred people at one point. And so even at 15, six, 16, 17 years old, maybe 16 years old, I had about a hundred people. And, you know, we recruited and we organized and, you know, the way that we kept our culture intact was by enforcing the rules, you know, physically. Right. Um, and so there are a lot of parallels to what I learned in the gang and, and what I've learned out, you know, in, in business, obviously you don't force the rules physically, but you know, there are enforcement of rules and things like that that apply in a business context that I learned in a gang. Okay, so I'm going to immediately hone in on the word you used, leader, right? Leadership. I remember when I was 18, I think, and I had dropped out of high school and I was trying to get into college with no high school diploma. And I ended up interviewing with like the assistant vice chancellor of the University of Houston or whatever, right? And it was this really nice lady, probably in her 30s. And she started asking me these questions in my story. And she turned out, it turned out she had a PhD in leadership or leadership science, right? Like she had, apparently there's like this thing that you can learn about and develop that called leadership. And that was the first exposure I'd ever had to this idea, the formal idea of leadership, right? Now running businesses every day, it's like, I mean, when I say my prayers at night, it's like, please make me a better leader. Like all I want is more leadership chops now, right? But back then, I mean, especially to young people. So, 
So I want to I want to hone in on this on this concept of leadership because I think it's I think it's the X factor, man. I think it's the most valuable variable in in existence, both both in terms of commerce, like commercial value. I mean, if you're building a company, you want leaders, but also just a person's likelihood of achieving the life that they want. Yeah. Is going to come down to their ability to in, inspire and enroll and align other people to their vision, i.e., leadership. So, were you always a good leader? Did you learn the skills? Like, how did you develop that? And did you have a sense of it as a thing at that time? Well, you know, technically, I was a bad leader. <laughs> if you, were, if you were scaring everybody, probably. Yeah, I, I was technically, uh, you know, there are leaders that work in negative energies and there are leaders at work in positive energy. So the, the description that you just described is certainly an inspirational leader is one that's utilizing positive energies, but there are plenty of negative energies. And if you look at all the big problems in our world today, they're generally created by leaders that are working in the negative energies. And then the solutions to those problems are created by leaders that are generally working in the positive energies. So, um, but yeah, I was always a, a leader. I was just pulled by the dark side for quite some time. Okay. And and did you do you feel like you you learned leadership? Was it modeled for you at a young age? Did the gang teach it to you? Like, I mean, a, again, I want to I'm always thinking about the audience and and I yeah. think the seed I'm trying to plant here is that don't make the mistake I made for many years and not see leadership as such a powerful so, substantive skill that you can develop. It's not just an amalgam of other skills, or it's not just being in the right place at the right time. It's truly a skill set you develop. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I I have to tell you that I, I, my prayers are to strengthen my skills as a leader. And, you know, and, and so I, I'm working on this more. I, I train more on leadership now than ever. So I, I'm heavily involved both in the science and the practices of leadership and I look at spiritual leadership and, you know, this is where I spend my life. So I agree with you. It is the most important skill. And I, you know, skill is a specific word that you can obtain. Some people by their environmental conditions, or you might say the calling on their heart from birth was to be a leader. I had no choice but to lead. No one was going to take care of me. No one was going to provide me food on the table. My parents were both, uh, uh, you know, dealing with their addictions and their their traumas and their challenges. So I had to lead myself. And then in order for me to get the life that I wanted, to be to use your words, I just started leading others at a very young age. And um and as a result of that, you know, I started learning concepts of leadership, recruiting and evaluating people and determining whether or not I could trust them and whether or not they were going to do what they said they were going to do. And I learned that stuff on the streets. And I then learned all different types of leadership once I got into corporate America, and now I've infused kind of, you know, both spiritual leadership, what I've learned in the streets, and then what I've learned in studying of uh, corporate leadership. But I, my environmental conditions forced me to be a leader. Now, some people that don't have those environmental conditions that, you know, they weren't forced to be a leader, um, you know, they can still acquire the skills. They can still step out and take risk. They can still work on overcoming the laziness or the procrastination or the things that are stopping them from being a leader. I just had no choice. Laziness was not an option for me. Procrastination was not an option for me. The only option for me to survive was taking action and being a leader. Yeah. So laziness was not an option for you. Um, and, and I will, I will free, you, th those are your words. I'm not necessarily agreeing with you. I'm just repeating what yeah. you said. Um, Cause I, I think people, I think anybody can fall prey to laziness at any time, but um, and actually, yeah. So I, I kind of want to, want to probe on that. Like, go for it. That, you know, you, you, yeah, you know, we don't need to be gratuitous about digging up your, your childhood trauma, but I mean, you had parents that were addicts, obviously you weren't raised by them. I mean, you went through some, some hard stuff, right? I don't think it's unfair no, to say that. Go ahead. I'll tell you, I, I, you know, I can tell you my dad's no longer with this. I could feel his presence with me right now. He whooped my ass if I didn't get shit done. Like, okay. you know, like if he said, go get a tool and I walked to go get that tool, I'd pay a price for that. And I learned how to, to move. My dad was a military person, disciplined person. Laziness was not an option. For and me. you say and discipline, I, you mean physical, like literally whoop your ass, physical discipline? Physical discipline. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so it was not an option. I couldn't be like, Dad, I don't feel like uh, doing yard work today. Okay. Like, that that would have been World War Three in my household. Like I'd have been ripped out of bed and thrown out in the you know in the front of the house to do the yard work. Like that. Right. That was laziness was not an option. But later on in life, I could have chosen la- laziness. But I it so was, when when were you when were you no longer in that environment? At what age? Well, when I moved into the streets, you know, I was hungry. I was a growing kid, so laziness wasn't an option there either. And the lazy were taken advantage of on the streets, like. In order for me to protect myself, I had to work. I had to bring in revenue. I, you know, I wasn't the most thuggish, strongest, meanest guy on the streets. So I had to be a high. I had to, inco- I had to earn income, yeah. um, and that's how I got my power. Was by the fact that I, I made a lot of money for the people that were uh, in power. Okay, so so maybe laziness wasn't an option for you then. <laughs> for me, you know, for me. It's an option for me now, though, but it goes against my DNA. Like, right, could, now that, and that's what I'm getting at, too, is, yeah. I mean, there's still something in you that's just fundamentally not lazy because if anything will tempt a naturally lazy person to express their laziness, it's probably $800 million. So yeah. you're not lazy, right? And and so I, I uh, you know, I okay, so you're not lazy. That's one qualifier for success. Yeah. But there was something else. You mentioned a mentor. And, and and by the way, let me let me just state for the record for you and for anybody listening who's like, I've heard a few of these episodes, but like, what the heck is he really getting at? The point of this show, this show started as a research project to try to find commonalities between outlier high performers in various disciplines, right? Yeah. And I'm trying to essentially so- calculate the extent to which you're either born with it or... It, like nature versus nurture, right? Or you can develop the abilities that make you a high performer, an outlier success at whatever you want. And after 200 and I don't know, 30 or 40 of these interviews, the, 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 the idea that you're born with it, like that's out the window, man. If anything, what I've identified is the best thing that you can be born with is a whole lot of suck, a whole lot of hardship, because it, what yeah. that's going to do is it's going to put a fork in your road yeah. where you're either going to break bad are you going to break to success? Yeah. Um, and anyway, anyway, so that's the context of, of these questions, right? Is like, it's not, it's, it's about Ryan, but it's also about what's not even about Ryan. It's just the truth. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you can, everyone suffers. So, you know, the, and I, I have friends that were born into extreme wealth and they'd suffer more than I suffered, you know, because they had it too easy. They could never, uh, you know, please their parents. They had to worry about what everybody thought. They had to get into the school. Like, you know, their whole structure sucked. Mm-hmm. So I know, uh, you know, billionaire kids that, you know, got caught up by drugs and are no longer with us. You know, I, it, everyone is born into some sort of condition that they are going to have to suffer until they choose not to. I, I chose not to. You're going to suffer from laziness. The underachiever and the overachiever have an equal amount of suffering involved in their life. Mm-hmm. Right, it's all the same thing. It's, I suffer by being an overachiever. I have right. to pull that that way back. And underachievers suffer by being underachievers. They have to, you know, turn on a switch in them and start to actually, you know, uh, think about different elements and and what will bring them total happiness. So we all get to the same place. It's the same. It's the same walk. Yeah, right? choose, choose your hard. Right, that's what they say. Yeah, but well, you. So have, I'm curious if you could tease out what you think the difference is. Difference between an overachiever and an underachiever? Yeah, between somebody that suffers now for a gratification delayed or somebody that suffers for an inability to delay gratification. That's, you know, here, what, I mean, what determines which way a person goes, do you think? But the end result is this. We're all going to get to a place when we're 80, 90, and, and we, we know we got a limited time left. Right. And that, that might happen earlier than some of us. God willing, it'll be 90 years old. And am I going to say, I regret working so hard? Or am I going to say, I regret not working that hard? Right. Like we're, you know, the, I, the objective of life is to get to that point and say, I have no regrets. Right. Yeah. If I, if I work too hard and my kids hate me and nobody's showing up to my funeral, and I got a billion in the bank that I'm going to give away to strangers. They're going to spend it however the hell they want to, right? I've failed. Now, if I don't work at all, and I'm at 80 or 90, and I don't have enough money to pay for my medical, 
and I don't have enough money for food, then I fail, right? You know, and so it's really, you know, how are you designing a life so that when you get to the end of it, you are actually without uh, major regrets. That's it. We're all trying to get to the same place. And the overachiever has, a, you know, a dilemma of their own and the underachiever has a dilemma of their own. And for us to get to that place, you know, the objective is, is just look forward and say, based on the trajectory that I'm at now, what I'm doing now, am I going to have regret at the end of my life? So obviously you, you work, you help people find their calling. I want to, I want to get into that. Um, and I, but I want to kind of maybe set up the entry to that topic with calling out a third, a third type of person. Yeah. The, let's call them just the socially acceptable achiever, the achiever of the expected, right? Mm. And the medium achiever. Yeah. Yeah. Most people over. You have over and you have uh, people that are hitting it right at the mark and then you have under. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah and it's a bell curve. I mean, the big the fast big. middle yeah. is in the middle. And the tragedy that you touched on is that the outcome for the underachiever and the outcome for the middle achiever in the modern world, in the modern economy, is actually pretty close to the same. I outlived my money. I can't stop working. I can't afford... I mean, maybe I can afford whatever Medicare will pay for, but I, I can't afford that elective thing that would actually improve my quality of life. Like, yeah. like, like I'm getting ready to go down to Panama to get stem cells because I'm tired of my joints hurting. I'm not getting insurance help for that. Like there's a, there's a whole list of things that make life really a lot better. These aren't like indulgences, like buying a yacht yeah. that are off limits to you unless you're a multimillionaire. From, you know, agri I mean, maybe you could do one of them, but you can't do them as a lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and so the tragedy of life and part of the mission of this show is actually to call out for people that the middle life still ends in a whole lot of regret for yeah. most people. Yeah, that's it. Like, you know, if, if you can, well, if you can't take care of, you know, your, your family the way you want to, if you can't take care of the health the way you want to, then you haven't worked hard enough. Right. And that's a big number, you know, like you're going to need 20 million, you know, to ride out, you know, the end of your career with like, you know, you got to have a, a, a chunk of change stacked up to be able to take care of your health and your family with inflation and everything else. You know, you know, it's a big, bigger number. Yeah. Than you think it gets yeah. And you take care of your health and you take care of your kid. You teach your kids how to take care of their health. Yeah. Now you got a, a brood of 10, 20 extended relations that are all living to be 90 years old. Yeah. This idea, I mean. I saw data the other day that the, the, they're going to update retirement guidance. That I think the new retirement age is going to be like 80. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. it was a, a report from McKinsey. But anyway, I'm, I'm just calling this out because I think a lot of people look at someone like you and they see an exception, which statistically you probably are. Yeah. But, but the thing to learn from an exception, I would suggest, it's not to figure out all the reasons that they're so different from us so that we can give ourselves the excuse of why we're not the exception is to figure out all the ways that we're just like them so that we can try to model whatever those little distinctions are to get more of an exceptional result. So, yeah. so anyway, that, that's but, the, but, the, the, go ahead. Jeff, so Jeff, to your point, I'm an exception because I did that that you just described. I met, I met a CEO of a multinational company and I stole the principal from him and I stole, I watched the way he shook hands or I watched the way she you know, conducted a meeting and I'm like, oh, I'm taking that with me. And I built a, a series of principles and practices and methods that now I truly am an exception. Everyone can be an exception too, if to your, you know, to, to compound on your point, if they quit looking for what separates them and they look for what unifies them, if they quit looking for why they are different than other people and realize that we're all very, very similar. Like if I could steal a best practice, a best practice from you or from someone else, I'm going to add that to my operating system. And my operating system is going to be more efficient, faster, have greater sustainability and longevity. And all I'm doing is building my code base all day long. And that's what, that's what everyone has to do. Because the operating system that we inherit from culture, from the industrialized complex, and from our parents, 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 and even biologically, the operating system that we inherit inherent is absolutely garbage. Like it, it is not efficiently running this thing here or the heart or the soul for that matter. 
in any way, shape, or form near its full potential. So we're getting a, an operating system for you know a 1978 Toyota Corolla, and we have a Ferrari basically engine. And so we have to upgrade the operating system by listening to people that have found best practices, principles, philosophies, and saying, "Ooh, I'm going to take that one. And I'm going to throw away the old code, you know, that I inherited from culture from my upbringing." Mm-hmm. So I'll share with you, and, and, I'll, and then I want to I want to dig right into these principles, but I I want to share with you um, kind of a framework that I've developed around exactly what you're talking about, about how to how to find great role models and and emulate or me- be be mentored by them, whether with or without their permission, right? I mean, you mean mentored, I, I got mentored by Stephen Covey. He doesn't know who I am, right? Yeah. So like how to how to really download the right stuff from a mentor or a role model. And it's it's this hierarchy of tactics, strategy, vision, and principles. Mm-hmm. And before I'd say before we go into the second half of this conversation, what I want to encourage the audience is as you're listening to Ryan, We'll have to talk. I mean, the the plot points of his story. Let's call those the tactics, right? Like, well, I I did this to achieve this. That's that's like the superficial level. Below that, there's a strategy, which is like, of all the things I could have been going after, I chose to go after these things in this way. Yeah. And and I think a lot of times people will look at someone like you and be like, oh man, I, I got to know what he did. I'm going to do what he did, right? Yeah. And they're thinking, like, how do I tactically emulate this guy? Maybe. They're thinking, how do I strategically emulate this guy, right? Like, what was he focused on? And I'll focus on that. And then a layer below that, I put vision, which if your strategy is essentially, okay, of all the things I could be focused on, which way am I going to focus? Your vision is what's at the other end of, of that, that site, that line of sight. Like, what are you striving towards? And your strategy is how you're going to get there. So I think when you get people that are like, they get caught up in a movement or they get caught up in a mission. Like, oh, I'm going to align with this person. Like they, they, they instinctively sense that they have gone a layer deeper where, okay, I'm not trying to emulate this person. I'm trying to latch onto their vision. Yeah. But what I want to suggest is vision is so contextual. It's so personal. What we're really trying to get at is below vision. It's the principle. It's why they see what they see that creates the vision that then drives the decision of how that drives the strategy that then choices that drives the choice of what, which is the tactics. You got to get all the way to principles. If you really want to learn. I'll give so, you, go ahead. Let me give you a use case. So I, I, I agree with your framework and I love it. I'll give you a use case where you combine the two. Okay. And for example, I'm working with scientists on an AI project right now. And I tell them that I want to create Nobel prize worthy work. I'm not trying to do this to make a buck. I'm not trying to do this because I want, you know, to be cool and be going along with the chat GPT trend. And, you know, I'm doing this because I want to create Nobel Prize worthy work. I want to create work that actually is so innovative that it is worthy of that, whether it gets it or not. Right. So that's vision for the quality of work that that paints a vision for my engineers to say, we're not going to compromise. We're not going to, you know, uh, chase a buck. We're going to do stuff that actually changes people's lives in such a way that it would be worthy of such a thing. So that's both a tactic and a vision that I utilize, you know, in the leadership of my teams, for example. I love that. That first of all, that sounds super cool. And I, I hope we have time to geek out about that. I want to know all yeah. about it because I'm, I'm, we're starting to bring AI in and, and, and like you're mentioning, it's not about being a dilettante or just playing with cool new toys for us. It's like, how do we use this to really truly revolutionize business performance in a, in a couple different portfolio businesses that were applying it. But anyway, I'd love to geek out about AI. But right now, let's dig underneath all that. Like, what do you feel like are the principles? Like, how would you articulate your principles? I mean, within reason, I mean, we could probably spend all day talking principles, but how would you articulate them? And then how do you trace them back to where they came from? Well, let me give you a process. So and I'll answer the question by telling you my process. So you know, I've, I've met and been mentored by some great coaches, great business leaders. And every time they would give me something that was just, just resonated, I would write it down. For example, John Wooden said, it's not uh, who's right, it's what's right. And for the rest of my life, every time there's conflict in an organization, I point him to John Wooden. It's not who's right, it's what's right. Every time people are complaining and fighting with each other, guys, back to the what here, we're stuck on the who. And so that single principle became a guiding force in my life building organizations. And it's 
It's from a basketball coach, right? So it wasn't in business context, but I was like, I need this. And I use it day in, day out. I have a running list of principles that I've acquired. I put out some publicly on my websites. I have 50 that I give away for free. Another 88 that I've uh, extracted, developed. Uh, and I have a running list of principles that I'm constantly writing, extracting, and developing that right now numbers about another 150. So I've accumulated something like 350 different principles for life and for business, for family, for being a father, for being a CEO. And some of the principles I apply more often. Some are seasonal. Like this is the principle that resonates during the season. Some will be with me to my dying day and I'll remind people of them forever. So principles are extremely important to me and I'm constantly articulating them, crafting them, and I train on them. I'm, I'm constantly unifying people based on principles and reminding them of the principles that, that we utilize to inform our decision making and we, that we utilize to, to uh, you know, ignite projects or to kill projects to hire people, to fire people, to grow our culture. Everything is principles to me. Yeah, a amen. Um, God, you look at, I mean, just the most iconic success stories out there and they're just they are just so pr grounded in principles. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously thinking of Ray Dalio who wrote yeah. a book called Principles, but yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, it's just, it's universal. And this, I mean, to me, the first principle that I absorbed from some of the most successful people that I studied was to be ba to be to be principled. Yeah, that was the first principle. Yeah, I mean, the first, first principle is use principles. <laughs> yeah, cut through all the noise and the chaos. And I mean, you'll spend your entire life making thousands of little decisions every day, unless you make a small number of huge decisions that eliminate the need for most future decisions because you've established principles. Yeah, it, I see it as code. You know, it's if then. If equals true, do. You know, like that's just, it's, I, I try to distill everything into its simplest piece of code mm -hmm. because yep. it's, everything is so complex and there's so much management there. It's like, give me a single piece of code. Tony Shea, for example, told me, Ryan, if you want to get to know your team members, go camping with them. I was like, if equals true, do. I now take my yeah. team members camping, right? Because that's how I get to know them. Or I'll even take people that are prospective team members on a metaphorical camping trip. You know, we'll do an event together and we'll work together for three days straight, for example. So, you know, I heard him say that. Great genius of culture, created great results. I don't need another principle for how I get to know new team members, right? He gave me it. I resonated. It works. I've applied it. And I'll apply it, to, uh, you know, for as long as I'm leading organizations. And for anybody that didn't catch the reference, Tony Shea was the founder and CEO of Zappos. Yeah. Uh, pass uh, and, you know, and so people like that, you know, you meet them or you see an interview and you go, okay, that's one that I can add to my code base. And then you apply it and you have to, uh, you know, con consistently apply it and review it. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll build a principled way of building a business. Elon Musk uh, is a first principles driven individual. The founder of Netflix, uh, you know, talks about his principles. Every great leader of any large organization I've ever met Literally, they're hanging the principles on the walls that they create and lead and manage their organizations with. Yeah, so I've I've interviewed uh, two of the people, um, Reed Hoffman's co-founder and the uh, uh, what was he? He was the first. I don't. Know, he was the first. I think he was the head of distribution for Netflix, and then he later was the president of Redbox, right? So I've interviewed some people that were really close to Reed Hoffman, yeah. and they'll they they both shared that he was pretty un, unreasonable about his, about his print. Like some of his beliefs, he could be pretty, pretty abrasive. Yeah. If you, if you encroached on stuff that he believed w was true. And this is something that you find with a lot of really, really successful people is like, like when you said it's not who's right, it's what's right. The inverse of that is like, don't mess with my principles. <laughs> you know, well, my job as a CEO is to find the flaws in people's arguments. And so if you bring an argument to me, you better be prepared with evidence to support it. And by evidence, I mean factual based evidence. That's the job. Our job mm -hmm. is to find flaws in arguments and to seek the facts in, in the situation and apply principles to making good decisions. 
the best of us don't get it right anywhere near 100% of the time. If we're lucky, we're getting it right 70% of the time. So I'm willing to be called out, called forward when I get it wrong because I, I make a lot of decisions. I take a lot of risk, which requires a lot of decisions. And so I don't get it right 100% of the time. And every time I get it wrong, we go back and we unpack the principles. And then oftentimes we'll add a principle or we'll add a piece of uh, to our culture code as a result of the failed decision. And eventually over time, you get a culture that's operating and making great decisions together. And as a result, you get good success. So one of my favorite quotes that I want to share with you um, is by a, a British mathematician. I just Googled it over here to make sure I say it right. Um, he's a British mathematician. His name was Al, uh, Alfred North Whitehead. I don't know if you've ever studied him. I have not. British uh, mathematician and philosopher. But one of the things he said was, civilization, this is, a, this is a principle, right? He says, civilization advances, which is another way of just simply saying progress, is extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about. <laughs> Right. And like you think about like preserving food used to be like a 19 step process that you had to think about and remember what to do next. Now it's called throw it in the freezer. Right. Yeah. That's progress. And so I feel like this is what I'm trying to do. And I'm curious how much you resonate with this to build a life where like in, in, in societal progress, we would call it an invention. Right. Like they figured out a way to do that thing that collapsed nine steps into one. Right. And, and now we, we can automate it. Yeah. But in, in an individual life, an invention is a principle. Yeah. A principle is a, is a decision that can collapse a lot of decisions into one fundamental decision. And now you don't have to make that same decision over and over. Like you said, you make a lot of decisions as a CEO. But the distinction is, you're making new decisions constantly. You're not remaking no. the same decision in different clothing because you already made those decisions because you have a principle. So I'm trying to build this life the way Alfred Wife Northhead create, you know, envisions progress in civilization of like decisions that allow you to bypass a lot of decisions without having to think about. Well, one, you know, one for example, I'll tell you I'm scaling a company because I'm I'm scaling a company very quickly right now. Um, and you so and me I'm, both. So let's yeah. talk about that a lot. Yeah. So I'm, uh, but I'm applying. I'm a, well, the reason why I share that is just because I'm applying this in a highly scaling environment. Mm -hmm. Like for example, you know, I, I, um, we have a principle: be wary of unforced errors. Right. So if we've already discussed this error, because we all make errors, and so we have a culture that accepts them, but we don't want to make the error twice. Another principle that I live by is: you cannot be promoted if you can't be replaced. And so this particular principle drives me to constantly look for how do I split roles, hire new leadership, or uh, hire new people to enforce leadership. So that way I can be replaced in the role that I'm in today because I want to advance my role. In order for me to advance my role, I have to replace myself. In order for my team to advance their roles, they have to replace themselves. That's a principle that has all of us seeking to replace ourselves constantly in the roles that we're in so we can advance our roles. So certain principles like that are highly conducive to scaling. So, so can, we, are, can we can we camp on that principle real yeah, quick? Go for it. Because how how different is that from how most people think? Completely most different. people make hundreds of micro decisions all the time around how to not be replaceable. Yeah, because they perceive that as insecure. That, that's an insecure feeling for them. And 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 whereas you simply decided one time that being replaceable is a desirable and you know essential piece of pro of progress for yourself well and the the key ingredient to that was i you know i believed at a very young age as an entrepreneur that i'd one day you know do billions of dollars in in sales so being a two hundred thousand dollar a year entrepreneur was not acceptable for me being a two million dollar a year entrepreneur was not acceptable for me being a 20 million dollar a year entrepreneur not acceptable 50 million 100 million it's not acceptable i i know that that I can, I have the capacity to do much greater things. I haven't always, you know, fully utilized and actualized my capacity by any means. But the, the, having that belief that I could eventually have a multi-billion-dollar company on my hands forced me to replace myself as fast as I possibly could to get there. Okay, so uh, I have 
similarly what most people consider ludicrous beliefs about my own potential. Yeah. Um, and so I want to ask you, where did that come from, do you think? Well, you know, I'll tell you where it first came from. I was a street kid, gang member. I met a, a rich mentor. He introduced me to some of his rich friends. And I thought to myself, not one of these guys could take me in a fight. Not one of them. Not one of them has the type of heart that I have. There's a gap between what they have and what I have. And I will figure that out and I will close that. Right? Because I didn't see them as anything other than a person that had some sort of knowledge. It was either voc at the time I had a street uh, uh, accent and language. And so I was like, it's vocabulary. And so what did I do? I went and bought vocabulary tapes and I went and rented them, in fact, because I couldn't even afford to buy them at the time. And at the time, you could rent audiobooks from audiobook stores. This is mm -hmm. prior to YouTube and the internet. And I'd listen to them over and over vocabulary tapes on business acumen, vocabulary tapes, you know, nonstop, because I identified that these people had a different use of language than me. And so I closed that gap very quickly. And then I identified other gaps. And as I closed those gaps, I surpassed those individuals in, you know, any measurement of success. And then I went on and met other people that had even greater levels of wealth and success. And then identified their gaps and then closed those gaps down. And, you know, and that's just the process that we have to go through is identifying the gaps of the people that have what you want, what is the gap, and then doing everything you can to close the gap. Yeah, and it's it's crazy that the inverse of that, which is what most people do, is constantly being told how to be and trying to comply and trying to please by people who don't have what they want or certainly don't have anything that approaches what they could have or what yeah. they're capable of. And I'm not just talking material stuff. I think oh, yeah. you know that. Yeah, uh, like a person in a failed relationship telling you you'll never have a happy relationship, right? It's like, well, you know, I'm not going to take your advice. Like, I'm only going to take advice from somebody that has the, a great relationship. You know, I'm not going to go seek advice from a person who's not modeling the, you know, the ideal that I'm seeking. So I was in my, in my early 20s, it's interesting you had that experience. In, in my early 20s, I was a piano player and I got, I, start, I got in with this one booking agency and they started putting me in the homes of very, very wealthy, successful people. Um, essentially, I got a reputation as a musician that won't steal your nice silverware, right? And like, I don't smoke and I don't, I don't like over talk to the other guests. And, you know, they just, they wanted me, they were comfortable with me in their home. So I'm playing piano for like, I mean, I played for like the owner of the Houston Texans, Bob McNair, the owner, the guy that owns the Rockets now, Tillman Fertitta, down, billionaires down in Houston. And I had that same experience of like, okay, I see the difference, but I also see the likeness. That's it. Let me identify the gaps, quantify them, not be mesmerized or, or intimidated by them and, try, and then try to close them, including, by the way, asking them, yeah. hey, how would you do what, you know, it's what I do now on this show, but I was doing informally as their piano player. Like, yo, tell me how you got so successful. Right. So. Yeah. You reverse engineered it. Yeah. So, you, so you, you just reverse engineer it. So how do you, what do you say to someone who wasn't, ex, isn't ex naturally exposed to people that are an order of magnitude beyond them in terms of some sort of success that they want in their life? How do you counsel those people to go figure out what these gaps are when it's not standing right next to them? Well, you know, I'll, I'll give you one that I now am acquainted with that I wasn't prior. You know, Tony Robbins, he was an anomaly to me. I, you know, I wasn't a good speaker. Uh, I would get red in the face and be sweaty. And so I went and I got his tapes and I broke them down and I watched. I interviewed people that knew him, you know, like uh, team members, employees that had worked for him. Uh, and to this day, I'm constantly, I have a person that will reach out and, and get me interviews with team members from companies that I'm seeking to learn from. Mm. So I'm constantly breaking it down. I may not know the CEO of a company that is, you know, I'm seeking to uh, learn about and learn about their strategy, learn about what they're up to, but I can get a hold of a VP and get on the phone with that VP and learn a lot about what's going on there that, that'll help me inform the decisions I'm seeking to make. So if I can't get to the source, but my my mindset is I reverse engineer, I try to break it down, 
And then, you know, I, I go to work and I suck at it at first. You know, I, I recently started singing and I had no musical aptitude. I wasn't a musician like you. It was like one of the lowest intelligent uh, levels that I had. No ear training, nothing. I hired the best coach. He was Whitney Houston's coach, Andrea Bocelli's coach. And I said, I want to learn how to sing. And he told me, he says, I've never had anyone sit in the chair that I was sitting in as bad as you are. Like I, he's like, you are the worst I've ever worked with. And I'm like, great. This is exactly where I want to be. I want to suck. I want to, but I want to, I want to know what the standard of excellence is, what the best is, and I'm happy to suck. And I'll suck at something for years until I figure it out. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is whoever ends up editing this, because I don't want it to stop and take notes right now. Send me, please send me a Slack as soon as you're hearing this saying, hey, that thing Ryan does where he finds executives in proximity to people you want to emulate, like do that thing. So thank you. That's genius. Yeah. And by the way, audience, do that thing. That's like one of the coolest ideas I've ever heard. Because you're right. Like I probably can't, it's gonna be a long time before I get Elon Musk on this show. Yeah. But I'm I could gonna... probably talk to somebody pretty senior at Tesla that works with him. Well, you know, and I'll, I'll give you a tactic. So I wanted to, to get all of Steve Jobs. You know, okay. He was, he was, um, uh, it, you know, his health wasn't there. I wasn't on the list of people he wanted to spend time with toward the end of his life. So I found a person who worked closely with him at Chaya Day. He had written a book called Insanely Simple. I got, I hired him and I said, and I sat him down. Then I got a hold of Nolan Bush and all the founder of Atari and I sat him down and I learned everything I could one degree separated from a person I wanted to learn about. Oh, that's just, dude, like, thank you. That is gold, man. Yeah. I hope and you I get something it, out I, of this because I, I just got gold out of it. Yeah, I do it now, by the way, just to give you. So I have a, a person reaching out on LinkedIn to, you know, there's coaching. I'm building a coaching platform utilizing AI. And there's companies like Better Up and Better Health and some big companies that are in the space. And so I'm constantly talking to ex-team members, ex-coaches, ex-VPs, ex-heads of sales. And I'm talking to them about opportunities to come work in my company. But if it doesn't fit, I'm gaining uh, wonderful marketplace insight. I don't, I, I don't want to call it competitive insight, but from that insight, I might go in a different direction than they are. I might not make the same decision. I might program around a weakness in their model that I ascertain as a result of talking to these people. Because so, you're not emulating them tactically or strategically or even necessarily vision, but at principle. So. Yeah, like, well, for example, no, even in, I'll give you an example in one particular model. I'm looking for the math. You know, I'm looking for what is the mathematical equation that drives this organization? And in, a, in one particular organization, I found out that they had a usage issue. And I thought to myself, okay, I don't want to build a product that has this same usage issue where they sell the product to a bunch of people, but no one uses it, right? Like that's a problem. But, you know, a gym, for example, they design their products to not be used. I right. wanted to design a product to be used. And so when I heard about a formidable competitor in the marketplace that had a usage issue in their product, I went back to my team and I said, ooh, we want to design to have our product highly used and not wind up in a situation where we have you know, uh, lots of revenue, but the customers are not using the product. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was interested to hear where you went with that. Um, is, it, is, it, is it an insight worth sharing? around what, how you sort of reversed whatever their challenge was. Yeah. So, I feel like for entrepreneurs listening, that's a good, that's a pretty good equation to understand how to get design a product people will use. Yeah. Well, so if I can find out that every business model has weaknesses in it, you know, every company and none of them are perfect. I've been on the boards of many and, you know, and so if you can reverse engineer and then find the areas where their product is flawed, then you can, you know, uh, you know, create a product that is better and that might, uh, have a better marketplace fit. Or you could just take that back into your design philosophy and say, oh, I, I don't want to wind up with this problem after I design out, you know, my product strategy and so forth. So I'm constantly seeking wisdom from uh, the marketplace. And, you know, and, and so I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I'm, I'm, I have my plan and my product strategy and my product team. And then I seek information externally from other industries, from other sources, that help better inform that plan. And, you know, for example, I have a friend who's an architect and she's doing um, architect, a space architect. So she's doing architecture in space and she's working with different materials and 3D printers and doing different things. And 
I'm learning from her and applying what I'm learning from her, you know, to the architecture of my business. It's totally separate fields, mm-hmm. but I'm looking for parallels that most people wouldn't seek out in the application in my particular space. So, so you're connecting spatial design to like organizational design and again, yeah. finding principles that connect. Yes. I love yeah, that. I'm, okay. I'm trying to connect obscure dots, analogies. Yeah. If I, cause if you can find an analogy in one business that applies to another, then you can create something unique because other people are so entrenched in their business. They're not seeking analogies, you know, for how can I do this business better by studying this business in a whole different field. It's like, uh, the I forget who the football coach was, but he made his whole offensive line go take ballet lessons. Yeah. Kobe Bryant took tap dancing lessons. Yeah. So, okay. Hey, listen, I don't want to run out of time and yeah. not give you the space to talk about what you're doing now, at least with Alter Call, if that's the thing that you you are sort of most, like, is that your calling, you feel like? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. then let's talk about it. Well, you know, the, the idea of Alter Call came um, when I, I'd gone through a, a difficult season in my life. I'd lost my mother, I was going through a custody battle, and I'd sold my company. I took two years off, rethought everything, and then I decided I wanted to start mentoring people, and I wanted to bring healing to the world at scale. And so I you know, started mentoring entrepreneurs because I, you know, I have a vast experience in entrepreneurship, and you know, I've, I've uh, spent 25 years in the space. And, you know, and from mentoring entrepreneurs, we started to build an organization. We now have many coaches that are serving entrepreneurs, hundreds of thousands of people, and we're building facilities in Northern Arizona. We just hired uh, scientists to build out an AI team. And in essence, our goal is to, our mission is to heal at scale. And we're working with entrepreneurs right now specifically because they have some of the most difficulties with mental health, uh, with substance abuse, and, you know, with, you know, um, the entrepreneurial roller coaster. So we're starting there, but we're expanding to other roles that we're seeking to help, um, you know, uh, optimize their their mental health and optimize their, um, uh, you know, their productivity and their efficiency in the marketplace. Yeah. So, so the 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 headline on the site says, "Alter your life to answer your calling." Can you speak um, a little bit to this idea that I assume every in your belief set everybody has a calling? Yeah. And what's in what's between most people and their calling? Well, you know, I'll just start by saying, and, and Jeff Bezos has a great speech where or interview where he said, you know, if you have if you if you have a calling, you're in a special place in life. And he talks about the difference between yeah. a career and a calling. I've heard that. I love that interview. Yeah, right. And and it's the truth. Like when you have a calling, you're not working. When you have a calling you're inspired. When you have a calling, you wake up in gratitude. Like you're just grateful. When you have a calling, a challenge that comes your way is an opportunity to learn and to grow. So a calling is the most coveted place that we can be. And AI is going to take the careers away. Yeah. It's not going to take the callings away. So if you can find a calling, you're going to be protected from the onslaught of jobs that are going to be you know, replaced with AI. But a yeah. calling is something where you know, you're out there serving, you're making the world a better place by the work that you're doing and by the creativity, by the innovation you're, you're bringing into the world. And the way you get to a calling is through a series of alterations. You have to alter the way you think, you have to alter the way you live, you have to alter the, the food that you put in your body. Like there's a lot of alterations to get to the place where you're deeply rooted in your purpose so much so that the work that you're doing is work that you're, you're, you're pulled to. Like the work pulls you. It's not something that you have to do. It's something that you get to do. And that's the that's that's the the holy grail of entrepreneurship. When you're when you're in it's a calling. And so that's what I'm seeking to help entrepreneurs get to is a place where they're so deeply rooted in the work that they're doing that they wouldn't do anything else. They love it, they live it, they breathe it, and it's as, it's the most rewarding use of time possible. I'm like, I don't know if you could see, I would just like stupidly, I'm grinning the whole time you're talking because essentially, I, I'm just going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a student or a, or a client of Ryan's, but I have experienced what Ryan is describing. I mean, about five years ago, I, evolved, I shifted from an entrepreneurial career to an entrepreneurial calling. And I started, I, 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 I literally need, 
I'd say on average, I run on about two hours a night less of sleep than I used to, but I still have far more energy and I've been sick a handful of times, maybe in five years. Yeah. Like a it's, calling is a, is its own fuel source. It, like, you're activated in your calling. It is not, it is not something where I have to do a bunch of checklists to increase my productivity and performance. And I don't have a thousand tasks every day in order for me to, to, you know, to maintain peak peak state and peak productivity. It's like I'm activated in this calling. This this work is growing me. I'm not growing it. Like it's this work is bringing right. me all the growth that I need. Yeah, and 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 I believe, and I feel like we're we're aligned in this way that for 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 a large number of people, I mean, there there's no pure black or white, but for a very large number of people, I believe that the entrepreneurial path is where they can find a calling that also allows them to like pay their bills. I mean, there's that there's that annoying survival thing we all have to do. Um, and, and I feel like entrepreneurialism, which I, I'm careful with that word, distinct from entrepreneurship, and I don't need to double click on the difference, but that way of being in the world, you can find a calling and make a living. Well, and, and have this thing that no one else has, and that's freedom. Yes. If you design it correctly as an entrepreneur, now if you design it incorrectly, the more that it grows, the less freedom that you have. Right. If you and I've been there. If you design it correctly, the more that you grow, the more freedom you'll have. And and by freedom, I mean I get I have freedom to take my kid on a bike ride any day of the week that I want to. I have freedom to take him to school in the morning and pick him up. I have freedom to make sure that I take time off when I want to go to my cabin and take 10, 12 days off. So ultimately you have a calling and you've structured it, designed it in such a way to where it gives you more freedom. The more successful it becomes, the more freedom that you have. So only because we're technically out of time and even a little over, and I want to respect yours, I'm going to, I'm going to draw, draw a line right there because that to me is a great cliffhanger for somebody <laughs> to go check out Alter Call. Because I, I, I suspect that. people are salivating at this idea, like go check out Alter Call. Um, and Ryan, thank you so much for your time. On that note, uh, beyond Alter Call, is there any great name, by the way, Alter Call? Um, is there is there any other place that you'd like to direct people, whether it's a book, social media platform, what whatnot? Yeah, you could catch me on Instagram. I'm at Real Ryan Blair, and if you DM me, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. What's the difference between winning and losing? What's the separator between success and failure? What's the separator between being happy and sad? I believe it's one more. You're one decision away from changing your life. You are much closer than you think that you're one away.